So imagine this. You're driving along the Trans-Canada in your fully loaded 15-year-old Dodge Caravan, hoping the gradient won't crack 10 degrees when you see the gas light come on. You're still 50 kilometers out from the next town and there's no cell phone service and you weren't clever enough to bring a spare tank of gas. So you pull over onto the shoulder and resolve to wait for a good Samaritan to save you. This fishing trip is not off to a good start. It's an hour later and you're still stranded. So out of boredom, you rummage through the trunk of the caravan for entertainment and find a hard copy of the Ontario Fish Consumption Guidelines. So you're like, nice, I'll take this time to educate myself. Unfortunately, you quickly realize that there's no information on your intended fishing destination. You're starting to think maybe this whole trip was a bad idea because honestly, you're not actually that good at fishing. Plus, you also recently watched a few ocean documentaries and became afraid of consuming too much mercury from your fish. And this is a reasonable fear. Methylmercury is a severe neurotoxin. It's readily absorbed into the bloodstream and excessive exposure can lead to tremors and changes in vision and loss of muscle coordination. Luckily, if you're wondering whether your target fishing spot may contain risky levels of mercury in its fish, you can use the WAC method. Ask yourself about wetness, access, and color. We'll break that down in my talk, Dundas Square 545, and talk about how human disturbances can impact mercury dynamics. Hi everyone, my name is Wei Ying Lam, although most people call me Wei, and you can as well. And I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto based at the Scarborough campus. Um, in previous degrees, I've studied biology and environmental management, but my true research love is hydrology. It's the study of water, where it is, and how it's used. It's one of our most precious natural resources. Like without it, there would be no life on earth. So studying water is endlessly fascinating. And my previous research has looked at water and nutrients, uh, water and road salt, but today I wanna to talk to you about my PhD research on water and mercury, specifically how human actions can change mercury dynamics on a landscape. Now, if you caught my pitch, I told you about one, the health dangers of mercury, it leads to nerve damage and other issues, and two, how you might be able to tell whether there's a high level of mercury in a water body by following what I call the WAC method. Uh, wetness, access, and color, W-A-C. So the WAC method. I want you to think about your favorite lake or river or water body. Like fix it in your mind's eye. I can tell you mine, it's George Lake at Killarney Provincial Park, um, easy. I'm super upset that I wasn't able to book a campsite this year, but I don't know, how about you guys? It's even okay if, if it's imaginary. So if you can think about that, like imagine your favorite lake or water body, if one like can't come to mind, think of what an ideal one would be or one that you've seen from a TV show, whatever it is. So once you've got it, let's break down the WAC method. Lake Ontario, also a very good one. People don't realize like how pretty the lake is. They see the Toronto Harbor and they would think like, oh, it's kind of nasty. Lake Ontario is a really great one too. All of the great lakes, I would have said great choices. <laughs> so. Thinking about all of these, I don't know if the WAC method will apply to the very large ones like the North Sea, but we can think about it anyway. First, the W, that's wetness. So think about the surroundings of your favorite lake or water body. Like, is the ground wet and squishy? Uh, methyl mercury, which is the type of mercury that builds up most easily in the food chain, is usually created in wet, waterlogged areas. And these areas can be as little as like a big old puddle in the dirt or as big as a wetland. So wetlands are exactly what they sound like. They're really wet. <laughs> so mercury levels in the water tend to be higher. So if there are a lot of like wet, squishy patches around, that's, that's maybe not so great. Second, A, access. Was it hard to get there? It's good if it was hard to get there because there weren't many vehicle access points. Roads and building roads can cause erosion, which is you know the gradual wearing away of soil and other disturbances as well that be into waterways. Last color, C, W-A-C. So is the water there, is it pretty clear and blue or is it more like yellowish or even brownish? That color, if you see that, is 
coming from dissolved organic matter, which isn't a problem in and of itself, but it does kind of impede the process of sunlight through the water. So if you have like darker patches, sun doesn't reach as far down. And sunlight is one of the things that can break down methylmercury into less harmful components. So we generally prefer clearer waters. But with all that said, if you're not testing fish in that lake, it's hard to be 100% sure whether you need to be massively concerned about mercury. So even after going through the WAC method, that's wetlands, access, color, it's also a good idea to follow these two tips to be extra safe. First, eat smaller fish. They're probably lower on the food chain and less likely to be contaminated. And second, eat leaner fish. Fish like panfish and perch typically have lower contaminant levels than fatty species like salmon or trout because fat is super efficient at storing toxins. And if you're still in doubt, most popular lakes ha are listed in the fish consumption guidelines, which will tell you exactly how many servings of that fish you can eat per month and stay safe from toxins like mercury. Now, at this point in the talk, I must admit that I may have misled you all a little bit. <laughs> See, my research isn't really about helping people identify what lakes are safe for fishing from a mercury standpoint. That's just something of a small side benefit I'm able to offer. What I actually study is how human actions, specifically forest harvesting, impact mercury on the landscape. So bear with me for just a moment as we back up here. I mentioned that erosion and other environmental disturbances release mercury into waterways, but where's that mercury coming from and how does it get released? Well, allow me to take you on a bit of a journey. So mercury gets emitted into the atmosphere by processes like coal burning and small scale gold mining. That's actually a really big one. So the gold mining itself is small scale, but the mercury it releases is definitely large scale. And once it's up there, once it's in the atmosphere, it gets transported out of its source region as part of a larger polluted air mass and can move around the world in a matter of months. And it doesn't stay in the atmosphere forever. Eventually it gets absorbed by soils or into leaves and plants or uh, into water, which is why we hear a lot about marine mercury. But the big pool that we're concerned with here is the mercury that gets stored in soils. So it can stay there for a pretty long time, but it can also be mobilized by things like certain types of dissolved organic matter that are usually carried by water like moving through the landscape. And once mercury is bound to that organic matter, it's more mobile and can then be transported to streams. And if it reaches a slow moving waterlogged spot, uh, such as a wetland or even just you know, a big old puddle, it can be transformed into methylmercury, which remember is the kind we most want to avoid. So mercury movement is really quite strongly tied to the movement of water on a landscape. That's why I, as a hydrologist, I'm still studying mercury. And we can think of that, so water movement, just generally, in terms of three compartments, right? We've got our inputs, our outputs, and our storage. So think about it for a second. What would some inputs be? Like, what are some ways that water enters a stream or a lake? Water that runs over the ground definitely gets into streams and lakes. And another big input is precipitation. So when it rains on there, uh, melting ice is also a really big one in Canada. So first you've got the input of the snow and second you have another input when all that snow melts and the water enters the landscape. So yeah, those are all of our main inputs. But what about, what about outputs? Like how does water get removed from a landscape? Trees, yeah. <laughs> so I, kinda, I guess I gave it away by saying think plants. But yeah, so water gets removed from a landscape from those two big mechanisms, evaporation, which is when it, you know, liquid to gas, and transpiration, so when it gets taken up by plants. So those are two components. Last, let's think about storage. So if you're thinking, you know, in the process of the water cycle, where is water stored? Lakes, rivers, and other water sources. Yeah, so you've got your inside soil, inside the ground storage of water, and then you've also got your surface storage. So your lakes, rivers, streams, and so on. Now, here's the bit where forestry comes into play. You guys are doing great. Uh, because those three compartments change when trees are cut down, and remember, mercury movement is really strongly tied to the movement of water on a landscape, right? So the first is maybe the easiest one. Here's, here's my forest. I told you the broccoli would come back in at some point. So if I pour my mug of water over this, 
how much of the cloth underneath gets wet. Probably not that much, right? Like this is a, this is a pretty tight canopy up here. So if I pour water over it, this is not going to you know, have a lot of water at the base. But what if I cut away half of the broccoli? What if I cut away an extra part? That canopy just got way smaller. So that soil is getting a lot wetter without any trees, which affects our storage too. So it's so two compartments that are affected by this. So more water is stored in the ground. And what about outputs? Well, it's hard to illustrate this one with broccoli. It's a little bit tricky, but maybe think of your home garden or your house plants. Like, I don't know how many of you picked up pandemic gardening, um, but if you have any herbs, you'll know that even one little bunch of basil soaks up quite a bit of water every day. If you, if, if you get one day, it starts, it starts wilting pretty quick. So think about how much more water a 10 meter tall pine tree takes up. Now imagine how much water a whole forest of 10 meter tall pine trees take up, right? That is a ton of water. And without them, once those trees are cut down, once they're no longer taking up uh, water from the landscape, there's a lot more water that's left over. Water sometimes drips from the leaves. Yep, that also occurs. So there's also a lot less interception. So there's no, you know, the trees aren't taking up any water. They're also not intercepting that precipitation as it comes down. So without the trees, there's a lot more water on the landscape. And it's not like the trees are magically cutting themselves down either, right? So harvesting trees requires more than just chainsaws. It requires building access roads, which disturb all this mercury storing soil. And it also requires the use of heavy machinery, which squishes that soil down and creates these, these big old puddles I keep talking about. And so what are those roads and puddles really great for? Thinking back to the W and the A in the WAC method, they're great for producing methyl mercury. So forest harvest really has the potential to substantially bump up mercury mobilization, which is you know just flushing mercury out of storage, flushing mercury out of the soils, and also methylation, which is transforming that mercury from soil to the more toxic methyl mercury that accumulates in the food chain. And that doesn't sound so great because here in Canada and in Ontario, we have a ton of forests and forestry is a really big part of our economy. We can't just, we can't just stop cutting down all trees forever. That's not a realistic solution. So the, the okay part about this whole scenario is that we're working on solutions and we've got a few practices in place currently to minimize mercury mobilization and methylation. So for example, in especially wet areas, we only harvest in the winter uh, when the ground is protected by snow and frost and uh, you're never allowed to drive heavy machinery right up to the riverbank. You always have to leave like a little bit of buffer room. So my research looks at whether or not these practices like the ones I just mentioned are enough to mitigate mercury mobilization and methylation following harvest. Like, can we get that mercury export to a reasonable level? And if they're not enough, we're asking, what can we do to improve them? Like, how can we make the existing guidelines better so fewer people are at risk of uh, mercury toxicity? And we're also looking at stream mercury levels following natural disturbances, because that gives us a benchmark to compare to. Um, so a lot of natural events also impact those three compartments of water movement, right? You've got your inputs, outputs, and storage. So question for you guys, what are some disturbances you can think of that would occur in forests. <laughs> there are so many things that can happen. Yeah, so many disasters, so many disturbances. Um, forest fires are actually one of the big reasons that we can't just not cut down any more trees because the way the carbon cycle works and the way the climate works, if you don't cut them for long enough, they will eventually burn. And that also releases mercury. Um, so does flooding, so does uh, invasive pests. Lots of these things impact the water cycle in those three compartments that we talked about. So a lot of disturbances can actually change mercury dynamics on a landscape. And that's why Ontario's forestry practices are all based on a model called emulating natural disturbance. So when we cut down trees, we try to do it in such a way that it's similar to what would happen naturally. If there was a insect outbreak or if there was a wildfire or wind throw. So there's also one big disturbance, but I guess it's not a lot of people don't think of it as a disturbance. Um, but one of the ones we're most concerned with in the boreal forest is actually beaver activity. So if you think about it, like beaver dams 
dramatically increase the wetness of an area, right? Once they've dammed it, the whole area is flooded. It's basically creating a small flood. And beavers are all over the place in the Canadian boreal forest. Plus, you know, after we cut down trees, there are a bunch of branches and bits that get left behind. And beavers love to use those to build their dams because we already did some of the work for them. So forested areas are also really popular for beavers and they have a huge mercury impact as well. So to explore the mercury dynamics on these landscapes more, we're doing things like monitoring water levels and mercury and stream chemistry in 17 different streams in Northern Ontario. Some are, you know, some are completely pristine and undisturbed. Some are impacted by harvest. Um, some are impacted by beaver ponds. Some are impacted by beaver ponds and harvest. And we're just heading into our third year of monitoring now. Um, I head out to the field in a couple of weeks. Uh, and the results on harvest practices are not yet conclusive enough for me to share them with you. But a really significant part of that work was quantifying what kind of mercury levels exist pre-harvest in all of those different streams because that tells us how they might be impacted by forest harvest later. And it gives us a baseline to compare against, which is why I was able to start this talk with those handy tips on how to identify water bodies with more or less mercury, which in case you missed it, can be summarized by the WAC method. So wetness, access, and colors, WAC. You want the ground to be less wet. You want the water bodies to be a little tricky to get to, and you want the water to be on the clearer side, which luckily based on uh, people's favorite water bodies they mentioned earlier tends to, looks like it's probably the case. So if this is a topic you really want to know more about, feel free to follow me on Twitter at by the way, or hit up my website, whitinglam.wordpress.com. And if you only take away one thing from everything I've talked about today, it doesn't even need to be the WAC method. <laughs> um, I just want you to remember that the natural world is full of so much that we don't know and that we're not aware of. And the next time you're in a forest or a grassland or a city park, maybe think about you know, how water moves the landscape and all the good and bad things it might be carrying. Well, thanks for tuning in, everyone. I hope you have questions. I'm here to chat if you would like to. That's a really good question. So. The reason that gold mining is associated with mercury is because it's really hard to extract gold ore. That's why it's worth so much, right? So the way a lot of poorer miners do it is they use mercury and mix it into the ore and it binds the gold. So they're able to extract the gold that way and you now have a mix of gold and mercury um, and you can burn off the mercury to get just the gold. Um, this is a super dangerous way to mine gold because of all you know the negative impacts of mercury exposure. So generally people try not to do it, but a lot of uh, less developed countries will use that. And it's called small scale arti or artisanal gold mining because usually it's only a few people or it's a, like it's a very small operation, but because there are so many of them and all of them have such a big mercury impact as a group of activities, it becomes a very impactful thing. This is also a good question. Um, I'm, I don't think most people tend to not use mercury thermometers anymore because there are uh, more available and less dangerous ways to do that measurement. But it's similar in the way a lot of heavy metals are mined, just, you know, <laughs> overall mining. I'm not sure if it contributes to cancer exactly. Uh, I also have to preface this by saying uh, not a healthcare provider, hydrologist. <laughs> so maybe, you know, back up whatever you're thinking of by actual research. But the main concern with mercury is its neurotoxicity. So it's really about nerve damage more than it is about cancer. So it's like uh, super not recommended for, you know, young children or, uh, childbearing mothers, like if you're pregnant, I really don't advise sushi at all, um, just because so many of those large ocean fish, you know, carry a lot of toxins, not just mercury. But is it carcinogenic? I'm not 100% not sure on that one. Did 
definitely ocean fish. Like any of the big ocean fish you can think about, really terrible <laughs> in terms of mercury. Um, so like tuna is a really big one that I think most people would eat. Um, but any, any of the large ocean fish, not great. In terms of freshwater fish that you might actually encounter fishing, um, like salmon should probably be avoided. Lake trout also not amazing. You want to go for the smaller ones. This is because uh, mercury accumulates really effectively in fatty tissues. So those like those big fish like the salmon, like the lake trout, have a lot more fatty tissue than the leaner than the smaller leaner fish. Uh, a lot of the fish organs also contain a lot of mercury, so make sure you know you're gutting and cleaning your fish completely before you eat it. This is an interesting question, and we don't actually know the answer to it, uh, hence the study that I'm doing now, because all of the existing literature, so if you're not familiar very much with how uh, research happens, most of it is just you're looking at what other people have already done and asking, what have these people not done yet? <laughs> that What's the question that hasn't been discussed yet? Um, and that is a big one. So we don't really know. All of the existing studies on mercury and beaver dams are done in like pristine environments that have not been disturbed. And all the ones that have been done on forestry um, have generally avoided beaver dams because they are a hydrologist nightmare. It's really hard to get a good idea of water flow. It's really hard to get a good reading of consistent levels when you have this very industrious beaver who is continually flooding the area that you're trying to study. So it's very like people will deliberately avoid that, which is why it hasn't really been done before. But I'm guessing that, or my hypothesis is that it will depend on the landscape and also whether beavers have been there before. So the first flooding of an area has the greatest mercury impact, but once it's already flooded and beavers tend to recolonize the same areas. So once it's been abandoned, you know, uh, a lot of the mercury stored in that soil has already been carried out. So if it's reflooded, it might not have as significant an impact. Thank you. And thank you for everyone for coming to the talk. Thanks, guys. I really hope you stick around to enjoy more of the talks today. Really great speakers coming up. <laughs>